This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. It's nice to be back. But some of your favourites have not returned to BBC Radio in 2013. First, The Departed. Alice Arnold, part of the exodus from Radio 4 continuity. Ali Jones, lured from Radio 2 for a job in ITV. Mike Harding has been ousted from his Radio 2 folk show. George Entwistle, after a very short tenure. And Peter Donaldson leaves Radio 4 continuity at the dawning of 2013. So, they're out. Who's in? Claire Balding, Radio 2's new voice on Sunday mornings from next weekend. Lord Hall of Birkenhead, who will return to the BBC as the new Director-General. Heather Bell, the once and now future Clary Grundy in the Arches. Mark Radcliffe, now presenting the Radio 2 folk show. Jamila Jamil, first solo female host of Radio 1's chart show. Here today, gone tomorrow, just like the BBC Director-Generals. Feedback fan Nick Lister was at risk in a far more serious way until a radio programme helped save his life. This sort of public broadcasting is exactly what the BBC should be for and uh, I'm delighted to say it's, uh, it's thanks to it that I'm still here. And does the Today programme understand the science of climate change? John Humphrey said that the Met Office does not believe that global warming will be as severe as previously predicted. Feedback correspondents say that's tosh. We'll find out if the Met Office agrees with them or him. But first, more names for that long list of goodbyes. Roger Day, Sue Marchant, Duncan Warren and many more presenters on the BBC's 39 local radio stations in England and the Channel Islands no longer have weekday evening shows to present. As from Monday this week, their programmes and many others were replaced by just one, a sort of national local radio programme. The Mark Forrest Show is three hours of music, listener interaction and, what it says, are the best bits from local radio output across the country. We'll review it a little later, but many listeners have been in touch to say how much they'll miss their favourite local presenter. We spoke to four fans before the launch of the new programme. My name's Nick Garner, I live in Chelmsford in Essex, and my local BBC radio station is BBC Essex. Sue Marchant's Big Night In. Big night in. And how are we going to celebrate that? One of the bands that I'm in, twice we were on her programme. I know she has two hours now on a Sunday, but you can't squeeze 15 into two. It just doesn't happen. And she used to promote not just music and putting on great music with international and local musicians, but also a lot of other arts, you know, from book clubs, theatre. It was all the local regional information which you just cannot get from anywhere else. Hello, I'm Sue Cashmore. I'm in the Radio Solon area. And I mainly listened to Roger Day's show, or I did, until it was axed. Um, I now listen to him on Sunday evenings. Anyway, it's Roger Twiggy Day for BBC Radio Kent. The others join us later on. So we get the Roger's show the is the only um, radio programme, music radio programme, I've stuck with. We've managed to get a petition up, and it's um, coming up to the 3,000 now. People are very incensed about it. <laughs> My name's Nigel Jackson. I'm a, a long-distance lorry driver. I live in Morecambe. Right at this moment, I'm on Rivington Services on the M61. Radio's with me, usually from when I start to when I finish. And Radio Lancashire is my local radio station, and wonderful people they are too. Keith Fletcher at bbc.co.uk. Happy New Year and a happy ninth birthday. When I'm on the road, being a long-distance wagon driver, the finest road reports by far are all by local radio. Tonight will be different. I'll be listening to the first show from Mark Forrest. I've no idea what to expect. I did catch a couple of trailers on Radio Lancashire uh, where he was talking about he's going to visit everywhere he's broadcasting to. Sounds like he's going to be on his pushback as well. Good lad him. Hello, my name's June. I run a little campsite in Cornwall, Timaru. We don't have electricity, so it's proper camping. I like our local radio, which is Radio Cornwall. Welcome, it's nine minutes past seven. Duncan Warren here with you through until ten, and we welcome all... He brings the people together. This week, because it's been Duncan's last week on air, it's just been so emotional. 
I like the radio because you can take it with you. You're not stuck in one place. I like to mix with the campers. They know that I take Duncan out onto the field. And a lot of those listen to Duncan Warren, even the goats. I mean, sometimes you'd, you'd look at the goats and they'd be dancing round and it looks as though they're dancing to the record. BBC Local Radio in the South West. Well, June, Nick, Sue and Nigel all promised to give the Mark Forrest show a try. We'll be hearing from them later to see what they thought of the first edition. Now for something much less controversial, climate change. On Tuesday's Today programme, we heard this headline. And the Met Office says it does not believe global warming will be as severe as it had previously predicted. Today's newsreader is... More detail was given in a report from the BBC's environment analyst, Roger Harabin, that a number of feedback listeners were concerned that the message was confused. Indeed, that the headline had been plain wrong. My name is Ruth Jarman. I live in Hartley, Whitney in Hampshire. Yeah, I think the headlines are so important because some people, that's all they listen to. This one is not only not clear, I think it's actually misleading. This is tosh, well, as, as near tosh as you can get to on Radio 4. The research looks only up to 2017, and so maybe useful for people who intend to be dead by then, but others of us may be interested in thinking a little longer term. That slowdown in warming is just that. It's still a warming, and I don't think this was made very clear in the programme. My name is Hilary Gander. I thought this was rather strange since I hadn't heard it from other sources, so I, I listened to the actual news item. And what it turned out to be was that the Met Office was saying that natural cooling factors such as ocean currents and things that happen naturally with the sun were driving this cooling and that after those changes had kind of run their course, temperatures would go up again. So to preface it with that sort of introduction seemed, well, confusing. Just some of the listeners who contacted me or tweeted at BBC R4 Feedback to raise their concerns. The Met Office, on whose figures the report was based, also had a lot of people getting in touch. Professor Julia Slingo is their chief scientist. I asked her if she thought that the Today headline, The Met Office does not believe that global warming will be as severe as it had previously predicted, was accurate. Absolutely not. I mean, just to put the record straight, we had not put out ourselves a report. We have, over several years, on an annual basis, placed our decadal forecast on our research pages. They are experimental, they are research in progress. And these were picked up by the sceptic blogs and the story was taken from there. So what should the headline have said? If you were writing the headline, what would it have said? Our headline would have said that our, our latest forecast for the next five years show that the Earth will continue to be at record warm levels, similar to those we've seen over the last decade, and with a fair chance that new records will be made during that period. Well, I have in front of me a statement from the Today programme, and they say uh, we accept that the headlines could have made it clearer that the new predictions announced by the Met Office regarding climate change only go up to 2017. Presumably you think that's an understatement. Absolutely. I think it's the interpretation of the forecasts that we are very unhappy about and that totally misrepresent the uh, integrity of the science that we undertake and the messaging that we would have given on these forecasts if we had had an opportunity to comment. However, the Today programme also say to us, Roger Harabin's subsequent report within the news explained fully the timescale of the revised figures and the reasoning behind it. Do you think he did? No, he didn't, because he didn't. He still presented this as a projection of climate change, and these forecasts are not that. They are actually a forecast of how the natural variability of the climate system may affect the trajectory of warming just in the next five years. And we are absolutely clear that, that this in no way changes our long-term projections of climate change and the seriousness of the situation. This is an extraordinarily controversial area, of course. Were you inundated with... Uh, we were. Were you inundated with calls? Yes. 
Yes, I've spent the last two days on this. Well, some will say, of course, this is a clear example of bias in the BBC, but others will say this is because you put out information which is immensely complicated and it's actually very difficult to understand. So do you bear a responsibility for not putting clearly in the statement both what the sign says and a note which says this does not mean that we have changed our long-term view about the effects of climate change. Don't you now have a responsibility to do that? Yes, we do accept that responsibility. And, of course, on the back of that, we have produced a lot of scientific briefing. If, of course, we'd had the chance to present the story ourselves, we would have, of course, put the appropriate messaging around it. Professor Slinger, thank you very much. Well, as we heard at the beginning of the programme, the end of 2012 saw an unusually large series of hellos and goodbyes on BBC Radio. Many of you have become my friends over the years and I've got to say that I've really enjoyed talking to you and sharing the music I love with you all. I'm Jennifer Worrell, I'm 24 years old, from Sale. I was very disappointed to hear recently that the BBC were dropping Mike Harding from his Wednesday night folk show on Radio 2. I'm a bit concerned that losing Mike shows a lack of commitment from the BBC to folk music. My name's Bill Bravener. I'm from Washington in Tyne and Weir. We've encouraged people to write to Bob Shannon, the controller of Radio 2. The responses that we've had have centred on things like the need to refresh programmes, and yet there are other programmes uh, which haven't had presenters refreshed. A lot of us feel that that's a bit of a non-argument. Hello, welcome to the Radio 2 Folk Show with me, Mark Radcliffe. Now, I first want to say how thrilled and honoured I am to be doing this, but I'm well aware that I've got quite an act to follow, so I know you'll join me... My name's David Gibb. I play in acoustic folk duo. I um, greatly admire Mark Radcliffe. He has got a background in folk music, he is a fan of folk music, but I think that what Mike really had was a connection to the folk scene. At this point, it would be traditional to say, hello, Mum, were it not for the fact that she's quite a fan of Mike's. But look, I love folk and roots. Very good morning to you. It's Sunday the 30th of December. As always, great to have your company. You're listening to me, Alla Jones, with Good Morning Sunday. My name is Peter Lewis, and uh, I live in the village of Aston, which is near Sheffield. I was gutted, as they say... He just is so suitable for the programme, and it does so much good. It's a sort of church, it's a sort of early Sunday morning service for them. Everyone is saying hello again. Why should we say goodbye? It's just after six o'clock. But for now, this is Alice Arnold, not only wishing you a very good night, but also saying goodbye. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for listening. Hello, Feedback. My name is Paul Durston from South London. What is the controller of Radio 4 doing, allowing all these voices that are Radio 4 to suddenly disappear from news and continuity? BBC News. This is Peter Donaldson. We had Peter Donaldson reading his last midnight news on New Year's morning. BBC News at five o'clock. This is Fran Godfrey. And talking of BBC Networks, what's happened on Radio 2? We've lost Fran Godfrey and Fenella Fudge. This is Fenella Fudge. Senior Conservative... Maybe Radio 4 should get its house in order and protect continuity with the last remaining voices who define the station now, like Corrie Caulfield, Neil Sleek, Chris Aldridge, Susan Ray, Carolyn Brown, Dinah Speed and Alan Smith. Or they all be going sailing by next. That's the world tonight. For the last time, this is Robin Lustig. So good night and good luck. Tis the end of an era, Robin. Why should we say goodbye? The controller of Radio 2, Bob Shannon, will be on feedback in a few weeks' time to answer your questions about the personnel and programme changes at his station. For example, lots of you have been in touch wondering why Radio 2's Sunday half-hour programme has been moved from its slot at half-past eight on Sunday evening to what some regard as the ungodly hour of six in the morning. Douglas Moody calls the decision ageist and cynical. Stephen Brent started his email saying, Words fail me, although they did not for long, as he followed up with a pretty full and frank appraisal of the decision, which he says will hit the programme's older and more infirm audience particularly hard. Jane Hunt, Cambridge. I'm really, really sad about this. It's a wonderful thing to have on a Sunday evening. And I, I'd be very amazed if somebody woke 
in order to listen from six to seven. It's an extraordinary time to have hymns. It's very, very disappointing that a program which is so loved by people, particularly older people, who are not going to be able to record it on iPads or pods or whatever they all these things. And the whole point is that it's live and you're sharing with so many others in the country. Hello, my name is Sylvia Olaf. What idiot has put Sunday half hour on at six o'clock in the morning? I don't know many people who are capable of singing a hymn at six in the morning. I couldn't even hum along with a hymn at six in the morning. Will somebody please think straight and put this back where it should be? Thank you very much. I'll ask uh, Bob Shannon, as he is also known, about that too. And if you've got any other questions you'd like me to put to him or thoughts about anything else you've heard on BBC Radio, good and bad, please get in touch. Mike Harding offers this handy summary. Well, just in case you wonder where I've gone, I've got a new job doing announcements. You can write to Feedback, P.O. Box 67234, London SE 1P4AX, or leave a phone message on 03-333-444-544. Standard line charges apply, but it could cost more on some mobile networks. Or you can email feedback at bbc.co.uk. All those details are, of course, on the website. I'm just going down to sign on at the Labour Exchange. As you know, in the autumn of 2011, the BBC was required to make significant savings as part of the licence fee settlement with the government. The management proposed particularly large cuts to local radio of 20%, that's around £15 million. But thanks to a very voluble outcry from the feedback audience, amongst others, that figure was eventually cut to £8 million. That's peanuts to BBC One, but a major blow to local radio. A variety of well-loved shows across the 39 stations have now been replaced by just one to be broadcast on every station, and it began on Monday of this week. We're on Facebook and Twitter, as you'd expect, at Mark Forrest Show. Directly, it's mark at bbc.co. Mark Forrest is the presenter of The Replacement Show. Earlier in feedback, we heard from four fans of BBC Local Radio who'd all promised to give Mark's first airing a listen. We all hooked up in the morning after the night before along with Gerald Main, who, apart from being the editor of BBC Radio Essex, has been working with the team developing the new show. I started our discussion, or should I say dissection, by asking Gerald how he felt about losing his own local evening programmes. Speaking as an editor of a local radio station, of course, ideally I'd want to be 24-7 and local through and through throughout, but the reality is quite different. What we decided to do was to try and showcase some of the best broadcasting across the output of the local radio chain. Pick stories that were great stories, interviews that had real quality about them, stories that would travel across the country, and whether you were listening in Truro or whether you were listening in in Middlesbrough, human interest stories that would make a connection. But that's what Five Live, that's what... Too. That's what most BBC network programmes are trying to do, as well as reporting the national news, to find those stories. So you're in an area of quite a lot of competition, aren't you? I think a lot of the stories that we cover aren't the ones that are going to get in the headlines that the Radio 4s and 5s is quite distinctive. The people who listen to local radio, who are by and large middle-aged and older. Interestingly, they they like an optimistic rather than a pessimistic outlook. What we're trying to reflect is some of the flavour of local radio, the warmth, the intelligence, the friendliness of, of local radio. So, yes, it is going out, it is a national audience, but I think what we've tried to do is to create a programme that sounds like it comes from the same stable, if you will, or the same family as BBC Essex or Lancashire or Solent or, or Guernsey or Jersey or wherever. Well, let's see if our um, feedback listeners think that. Nigel Jackson, then, what would you have been listening to at 7 o'clock on your local radio station during the week? BBC Lancashire, you're in Blackburn, I think. What would you have been listening to? I'd have been listening to Keith Fletcher, a cracking mixture of music, laughter, very light-hearted, would slot in anywhere, but the people all joined in, lots of texting and a lot of regulars, almost like a family. I know it's unfair to judge a programme on, and just haven't listened to it, you know, for a couple of editions and, and things will settle down, but let me ask you, Nick Garner, from BBC Essex, uh, does it sound like this Mark Forrest show, uh, does it sound like a local radio programme and do you want it to sound like a local radio programme? Most of it was not relevant to us at all and one of my thoughts was, 
it does lose the personal side of it, which you you get. I can only answer for Sue Marchant and other regions when I've driven through them. Well, Sue Cashmore down Radio Solent. The premise here is that you take of the programme is that you take the best of local radio throughout the country and you put it together so you can listen to, for example, a cracking feature from Radio Cumbria. Been going on last night. You know, I know it's the first programme, but they had, for instance, the closing of a sports stadium in Sheffield. That's of no interest to me whatsoever. And wedding disasters. It's not relevant to me whatsoever. One of our big challenges is to make those stories relevant to you. One of the things we did last night was to look at two community assets that were under threat, the Don Valley Stadium in South Yorkshire and the Spa Pavilion, and twisted and say, well, these buildings, these assets needn't necessarily go. What have you done in your community to save those important buildings? What have you done in your community to save things being closed? And that was the conversation that we were trying to develop last night. Now, Andrew Jackson in BBC Lancashire, is that the case for you? Do you care, for example, what happens down in Bournemouth? It's going to be very hard to get everybody interested in local like, items like that. Perhaps if it was a bit more like a person's story. And can I just check with June Hall down in Radio Cornwall? Um, this premise that we take the best of local radio and that you will want to listen to it in Cornwall, do you think that holds true? Oh, I've been listening to everybody's complaints. My complaint is we need local radio for our roads. Mark, last night, he couldn't tell us whether Lerin was closed or there was an accident at Polpero. Well, can I ask Gerald Bin? Supposing there is a flood in Polpero, will that get into this show? Absolutely. If it was a serious flood and it affected large numbers of people and, and the editor in that neck of the woods, Pauline Corsi in Cornwall, if she took the decision, actually, we would serve our audience better by opting away from the Mark Forrest show, then undoubtedly that's the decision that Pauline would take. Was well, that means that they've, they've got to have a news operation going whether they're broadcasting or not? That sounds a bit expensive, doesn't it? No, it's amazing, uh, Roger, how quickly a radio station can come together in the event of a bit of emergency broadcasting, whether it be snow or whatever whether it be flooding or whatever the, the disaster might be, uh, troops come in very quickly and can be assembled very quickly, I can assure you. But in the more run-of-the-mill, there are hourly news bulletins. The news offer in the evening is no less than has been the case prior to the Mark Forrest show. Where Gerald says, yes, if there's something major happening, it's the smaller things that affect a lot of local people that will come out through those local travel broadcasts and that, which did happen regularly every night. I think we have to come back to remind ourselves really why we are where we are. We're here because we're trying to save money and protect the rest of BBC local radio and protect the journalism and the distinctiveness higher up the day, whether the bulk of the audience is listening to breakfast, to mid-morning, to drive time and at weekends during the daytime. How much money will this save then? Local radio as a whole has a savings target between 16 and 20%. How many millions I, is that? I, I, I can't give you the answer to that, but as a, as a local radio editor, I suppose I'm looking at savings of about 150000 in, in, in my station in Essex, which is quite a significant amount of money. It's significant. Sue, what do you think about that? Well, perhaps if the BBC had looked after the licence fee payers' money earlier on, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. I'm disgusted at the amounts of money the BBC have been paying out to staff. Because Nick Garner, then, down in, in BBC Essex. Well, I think it is totally when they spend £189.3 on relocating to Salford and how much do they spend when they're covering the US elections, which do not affect us, how many people do they send out there? The cost, the waste could easily be made up for local radio, but we don't seem to be listened to locally because... They seem to think we're insignificant. If you put us all together across the country, I think you'll find that we are quite significant and a lot of listeners. Nick Garner at the end there. That's not the last we'll hear from our four local radio listeners. I've made Nigel, June, Nick and Sue all promise to keep listening to the Mark Forrest Show and we'll regroup in March, along with David Holdsworth, the controller of BBC English Regions, to see if the programme has grown on them. Good luck, Mark. Just before we finish this week, the life-saving power of BBC Local Radio. Back in November, science geeks far and wide were besieging Feedback Towers, demanding the reversal of plans to axe the BBC East programme Naked Scientist, because bosses had decided it wasn't local enough. Well, dear listeners, your cries have been heard. 
This weekend sees the first in a restored but revamped version of the programme, which will attempt to be both scientific and local to listeners of BBC Radio Cambridge. And that's particularly good news to one Nick Lister, whose own life was saved, he says, by that very programme. My job is actually an airline pilot, so I'm relatively health-conscious anyway. I was away on a trip, uh, and uh, I'd been in one of the hotel gyms, and I was really struggling on one of the exercise bikes. And I was absolutely exhausted after literally five minutes on this bike, and I came back to the hotel and literally collapsed on the on the bed for the rest of the day. Um, on getting home, my wife said, oh, you don't look particularly well, and... Initially, I, I put it down to man flu and the fact that it was in the run-up to Christmas and she was seven months pregnant with our first child. I just thought I'd burn the candle at both ends. What was it about the naked scientist that made you think, well, actually, this could be leukaemia? It was, it was largely the fact that they had done a programme on cancer and leukaemia that mentioned certain um, symptoms and signs you know, that people should generally look for. And at the time, I was 38, so I wasn't particularly old. And oh, no, you felt immortal, presumably, well, like exactly. most of us, yes. I, I did, and I've never had any health problems throughout my life of any consequence. So and was it that programme that made you think, together with your wife's urging, yeah, I must go to the doctor, I must have this diagnosed? Well, it was basically the fact that I was out of breath very easily, I was bleeding constantly. You know, if I, say, for example, I brushed my teeth, the blood would be coming out, something rotten. And so um, it was things that they'd said on The Naked Scientist about these signs and symptoms from leukaemia that I thought, just to be on the safe side, I think I should get this checked out. This was several years ago, wasn't it? It was several years ago. But they caught it early. They did. Um, I'm now six years into remission, and there's no signs or symptoms whatsoever. And you're uh, flying again? Uh, yes, I'm by flying. I was flying again two years later. Speaking to the specialists, they all say the key to survivability of this illness is diagnosing it early and so it's in no small part to the naked scientists that i'm still here you know because you know being a bloke i would have probably let it run for quite a lot longer and potentially that could have been curtains for me so now that you've heard the program has been saved it's a slightly different one now but fundamentally the same you're delighted presumably absolutely i, I couldn't sing the praises highly, highly enough you know, I, I haven't missed a programme in literally since it started. You know, th this sort of public broadcasting is exactly what the BBC should be for, and uh, I'm delighted to say it's, uh, it's thanks to it that I'm still here. So. <laughs> well, we're delighted you are. Nick Lister, safely back in the air. Now, just time to pass on your and my good wishes to Andrew Marr, recovering in hospital after a stroke. We all hope he will soon be back with his usual enthusiasm and distinction. I bet his bedside table is groaning with books already. Goodbye.